Welcome to the Special Operations Medical Association podcast series on prolonged field care. Any opinions contained in these podcasts are those of the authors alone and do not reflect U.S. Army, DOD, or U.S. government opinion or policy. All right, welcome back to the Prolonged Field Care Podcast. Last episode, we were having a discussion with Scott Weingart of MCRIT on the various issues a medic may encounter in the use of ketamine in prolonged field care. So let's get right back to where we left off. You've talked about uh, using ketamine for procedural sedation, where the procedure might be something like oxygenation, uh, delayed sequence intubation, or something else like a uh, chemical restraint. Is it something our medics should consider for certain situations out in the field? Well, let's think this through. So are you guys carrying oxygen? Very little and yep. usually not on target. Yep, absolutely right. So if you're not carrying oxygen, then there's no reason to do DSI or delayed sequence intubation because DSI will be uh, sedating a patient to pre-oxygenate them and you're not going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I would use ketamine in a different way. If I was in your position uh, in that environment where I'm not having oxygen, therefore I cannot get this patient uh, to wash out their nitrogen, to have this big buffer of time before they desaturate, I wouldn't give anything that'll stop this patient from breathing. So I would give a dissociative dose of ketamine, not for DSI to pre-oxygenate. I would give what we, what we a dissociative dose for the intubation itself, or what we call um, ketamine-assisted awake intubation, or you'll hear it as dissociative awake intubation, or Ruben calls it ketamine-facilitated intubation, but they're all the same thing. You're giving a medication that'll let you put in the blade without any trouble because the patient's fully dissociated. Whatever pain they would feel is being blunted by the ketamine significantly, and they'll keep breathing. So all of a sudden, a situation that really is scary, you know, because I in the hospital and a good patient will have three or four minutes before they desaturate. You folks in the field may have 30 or 40 seconds before they desaturate. But if you keep them breathing, then you have all the time in the world. You haven't taken anything away. This, in, if I was in your position, would be my intubation medication of choice is pure ketamine. And then only adding other stuff if it becomes impossible to do the ketamine facilitated intubation. Or I might consider if the, I could keep them breathing, but I can't find the glottis with my laryngoscope, performing an empiric surgical airway under ketamine becomes a very real possibility. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's good advice right there. Um, some guys are trying to, you know, figure out, do I carry sucks and try to keep it cool or, you know, do I carry rock or, uh, uh most of us in our recommendation for medics who don't get to get into the, uh, operating room or, uh, do RSI on a daily basis is to go straight to a crike because, you know, as I've heard, even you say, and this is from Rich Levitan and, uh, Bob Mabry put out our protocol and our, uh, algorithm basically, um, you know, six innovations a quarter or something like that, plus your initial, uh, initial testing and train up. And, uh, it's just really not possible with the, the massive amounts of medics we put through at our school. If a medic is going to use a, a large bolus of ketamine, like you were just talking about in order to RSI or crack a patient, uh, in need of an emergent or soon to be emergent airway, besides what you said, is there anything else they need to keep in mind? Uh, you know, you talked about, uh, a period of apnea earlier, um, in our tactical emergency medical protocols, it talks about respiratory depression uh, as a possible side effect. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. So uh, like I had mentioned, if you push it fast, you'll inevitably see a period where they just stop breathing. And the reason is they just blunt their CO2 response temporarily. And so the, then the CO2 actually builds up. And as soon as it builds up to any level where you would normally breathe, um, they start breathing again. And this has been the only experience I've had. I I like Ruben, where we were, you know, there wasn't this great big mass of people doing uh, ketamine for adult procedural sedation. And uh, Ruben and I were at the same shop and we both were very big fans of this. So we were seeing this a ton, um, all of the effects of it in, in patients who then could tell us about it and we could watch. And we had, t it wasn't like an intubation where you have to move right to something. You could watch exactly what's happening. I would time it on my watch. And every time by the 10 second mark, they would have taken a breath. And it's scary, especially because that time seems to stretch out um, when a patient who you've just given this medication to suddenly is not breathing. But it really is just about 10 seconds. Uh, I've never seen anything beyond that. And I've never seen this prolonged apnea that was case reported. So I would say if you're doing it for an airway, um, then don't even 
worry about it. Push the med. As soon as they're relaxed, move on. If you're doing it for a procedural sedation, before you get into the procedure, because ketamine is not a short acting drug, like something like propofol, where you really have to move quick because they might start waking up before you get the joint in. You got time on ketamine. It's going to be there for like 20 minutes. So I would push it and then just wait, watching the patient until they start taking a few breaths. And at that point, you know, okay, they're in a good place. Now I can move on to assessing whatever joint I'm going to reduce or whatever procedure I'm going to do. Um, and I would just make sure, okay, you know, yep, they stopped breathing, watching, watching. Okay, they took one breath. Uh, they took another. Okay, now I could concentrate on other stuff. And that way, if you were that one in a million where you had prolonged apnea, you know you have to move on to controlling that airway. Yeah, absolutely. So if a patient were our side or correct in the field, um, I've heard you talk about, you know, your post intubation checklist. Um, how effective is a lone ketamine drip for post tube analgesia and sedation? Or would you add something like morphine to take care of that pain that they're feeling with the constant uh, stimulation of their uh, pharyngeal nerves? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, the, the answer is we don't really know. I could tell you this. I, I've definitively used ketamine as a solo agent. But the patients I'll do it in, in general, are hemodynamically unstable, which is why they're getting the ketamine. And therefore, they might have some other reasons to be very nicely sedated because as your blood pressure drops, you get some endogenous sedation. Um, but these were definitely patients that without the ketamine were kind of miserable and flailing around. And then I put them on ketamine and all of a sudden they're happy. So I believe in my heart, it's just fine as a solo agent. Uh, you would have given the initial bolus for your airway itself. And then you want to either put them on a drip or give intermittent boluses. The drip we have some pretty clean numbers on. Uh, it's somewhere between 0.4 to 4, which is a pretty big range, milligrams per kilogram per hour. And you just slowly work your way up. Uh, if you're not going to be able to drip it in, and in many circumstances I bet you won't, then I would say you probably are just going to re-bolus when the patient starts emerging. Um, when they go from that nice, you know, just totally chill state to starting to writhe around, you know they need another dose. And whatever dose got them dissociated probably is going to keep on working. There really shouldn't be a uh, effect where the drug is uh, losing its capabilities over the short course you're going to be keeping them. You know, uh, we don't know what's going to happen at weeks, but certainly for, you know, hours to days, I think you're fine. Just giving that um, every time they start moving around, just give them another hit. Okay, so for the dose strategy for that uh, sedation analgesia, does it change depending on which procedure is going to be formed as far as, far as RSI and crike are concerned? Uh, because I've heard both that a patient with a crike needs more analgesia because of the pain from the incision or that the patient with the tube down the throat needs more sedation analgesia to overcome the constant pharyngeal stimulation. What do you think about those two you're, options? You're absolutely right on the latter one. And I, I'm pretty clear on this. And uh, it's it's definitive in trach patients, and I don't see any reason not to extrapolate that to crike patients, that they basically need no sedation for a crike or a trach. Um, yeah, I mean, if you cut down to the umbilicus from your uh, surgical incision, there may be some pain. But the the normal-sized incision limited by the neck, uh, it's really, you know, once, it, once the skin is closed, then you probably just do want to put some rough stitching in there just to close it around the crike, uh, it really shouldn't be very painful. You know, obviously, if you put your finger on it and start moving it in circles, it's not going to make the patient happy. But when you're just leaving them alone, it's very minimal pain. I mean, they could get away with a small dose of ketamine, the analgesic dose, or uh, morphine, but there's no reason to put that patient to sleep with a crike or, or a trach. Um, on the other hand, you just can't tolerate an endotracheal tube. And I, when people like you know, look askance at that. I tell them, take two fingers and put them up in front of your eyes. All right, you see those? Great. Now shove those down your throat and hold them there. And then they quickly realize that that's not going to work out so well without some potent analgesia and sedation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so we actually do uh, advocate using a ketamine drip for longer sedation once in the appropriate environment. Maybe if we got into a, a steady evac platform or maybe we're back at our house um, just because it does have, uh, you know, a better safety profile. Some of us have advocated for in the past uh, for bumping or mixing a small amount of midazolam into that drip to make the ride a little smoother. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, here's the thing. When you're dissociated, you're fine. Uh, and so there's, I don't, I don't know much benefit during the dissociation itself. It certainly wouldn't hurt, and it probably has minimal hemodynamic effects. So if you got the med, knock yourself out, because we don't have great data. But for me, the time midazolam starts to play in 
is as they're emerging because they be, you know, Ruben gave you this very nice spectrum. You have an analgesic dose, your recreational dose, and then your dissociative dose. And between the recreation and dissociative is this partially dissociated range, which is where all of the misery comes because the patient is still in dream state, but perceiving the environment, perceiving pain. And that's where they kind of freak out. But some patients don't. Some patients go through that zone as they're waking up with no problem. So for me, I like having the midazolam drawn up and ready. It's there. I got two milligrams of it in a syringe. But I don't give it until they they tell me they need it. And they tell me that because they start freaking out. So keeping them on it, uh, you know, you're not going to remember anything about your ketamine trip until you actually emerge. Um, everything else pretty much is having on a non-conscious level. So if you need amnesia because you don't want them to have a weird perception of where they were for the past day and a half, then you could hit them with the medaz as they're waking up. Um, so to answer your poll, I don't see any problem with it, but I don't necessarily see any demonstrated advantage to it either. Okay. Well, that makes sense. One thing I wanted to get into is the uh, catecholamine exhausted patient. So if you were in sustained combat operations and then you went in and you got some ketamine, you had a ketamine drip for a couple of days, um, is this something that could cause catecholamine exhaustion or depletion in a patient? You know, I looked into all this literature for, uh, in preparation for a talk for a big conference we do each year. So I looked at everything, and this is like going back to the 40s and 50s and all of this stuff. I was trying to find where did this concept emerge of you know causing negative inotropy in patients exhausting their catechols. Exactly. And from everything I could see, it's definitive it happens in isolated dog heart cells if you put them on the edge of a laboratory pin and you give them massive doses of ketamine. But I've yet to find any clinical demonstration of this. Um, now, you got to be careful because you'll read literature and it's going to say, oh, yeah, we did these patients and we gave them ketamine and uh, they actually decreased their cardiac output. But then you look at the study and these were patients that had uh, pulmonary artery catheters in. I mean, they had every monitoring known to man. So you really got a good answer. And the answer was that it wasn't an exhaustion of their catechols that was doing it. What it was is that the ketamine was increasing their blood pressure by means of increasing the squeeze on their arterial side. And that will, in any situation, ketamine-induced, vasopressor-induced, norepi-induced, in all those circumstances, if you raise the afterload, the cardiac output goes down. Unless you give a consequent simultaneous inotrope. So, the only way I could find in all the literature to sum all that up that ketamine reduces cardiac output is by raising blood pressure because ketamine may not cause the same uh, consequent increase in the squeeze of your heart while it's raising the blood pressure. Um, but in most circumstances, the reason your, your body naturally does that is if you raise the, the blood pressure, you don't need as big a cardiac output. Um, so this is a natural response your body has because the reason it was slamming your heart was because the blood pressure was low. So if you come along and raise the blood pressure, all of a sudden your body's attempt to make your heart squeeze as hard as humanly possible diminishes. So uh, I think it's all myth. Um, there's no difference between giving ketamine to a hypotensive patient or giving norepinephrine to a hypotensive patient or phenylephrine. All of them are going to raise the blood pressure. And all of them, if that blood pressure, the body likes it better, it's going to decrease the amount of squeeze on the heart. So I would not be concerned at the doses we're using in the emergency department or you're going to use in the field about depleted inotropes or catechols. All right. I think that clears that up for us. So also, I wanted to ask, way back on a podcast, I think it was 30, you interviewed uh, Dr. Richard Dutton. And for anyone that doesn't know, he has about 174 podcasts. So if you haven't got into it, just go and peruse a little bit and pick one of your favorite topics and check it out. But back to the question, uh, Dr. Richard Dutton, and during his conversation, uh, stated that you need to drastically reduce the dose, maybe up to 90% for any sedative agent when the patient is in profound shock. When a patient rolls into Janus General, uh, what about the patient tells you that you need to give this reduced dosage? Okay, so uh, you know, 
Rich was pointing that out for agents like propofol and fentanyl. And in my experience, I've extrapolated that to agents like Atomidate and um, pretty much any of the sedative-based intubation agents. Now, we've, we've said before, and I'll say it again, ketamine is not a sedative. So you can't put it in that same category of sedation agents as those other meds. That being said, we don't have great evidence for this, but it's my personal belief that if you have a patient hypotensive or hemorrhaging or with low cardiac output, you still benefit from a dose reduction of the ketamine. And we don't reduce it as drastically. We don't go down to 90%. But generally, uh, Ruben, myself, we both agree somewhere in the 25 to 50% range of your normal intubating dose. Now, here's the cool thing about ketamine is in the way you folks will be using it and in the way I often use it in the emergency department, there's no reason to give a big dose up front because what you could do is give a smaller dose and see what it does. This is a first pass agent, meaning you're gonna see the full effects in one blood circulatory time. So you don't have to wait three minutes and then give another dose. No, you give whatever small dose you want. And in most patients for me, that would be like 25 milligrams. And then wait 10 seconds. And see, they may be fully dissociated if they're in hemorrhagic shock at that dose. And then you've used the exact dose necessary and no greater than, and you really just perfectly optimize the patient. On the other hand, they're still moving around at 25. They're like, what was that crazy stuff you gave me, doc? But you're planning on sticking an airway in them? All right, give them another 25 or give them 50 at that point if the 25 didn't do much. And now you're really titrating to the exact dissociative dose you want. Because the thing about ketamine is once you dissociate, there's no benefit to additional med on the good side. But some of the side effects that you don't see if you do it this way, um, but that do come out when you give way too much ketamine, um, like hypersalivation, um, start you know rearing their head. And that's why I didn't even mention that one. Since I titrate my dose of ketamine, I don't see hypersalivation ever. But if you decide to give the three milligram per kilogram dose that the Canadians do, uh, you absolutely will see a patient drooling like they have rabies. So for me, a hemorrhagic shock patient, give a small dose, you know, 25, 25 milligrams is 25% of the dose I'd use on a regular patient. And then wait, five, 10 seconds, give another 25, another 50, and just get them exactly where you want to dissociation. Okay. While you're on that, you did talk about hypersalivation and our medics do have some uh, experience with glycopyrrolate. Would you ever use something like that if you thought you were going to dissociate them completely like that? I, again, if, if you're doing low titrated doses, I don't see it. I, I have not seen that. I, I, once I stop giving empiric two milligram per kilogram, which is what we were initially taught was the intubating dose and started using much lower doses, I haven't seen hypersalivation anymore. So I don't bother with the glycopyrrolate for sedation or for intubation. And the, the real reason is, is that if you give glyco, you're not gonna see its effects for at the minimum five minutes, but really realistically, it's closer to 10. And in most of the circumstances that you're doing this stuff, you don't wanna wait 10 minutes for something that's really not bringing much to the table. All right, I have about one more question. I know this is running kind of long. Our working group hasn't yet really started tackling sepsis, uh, even though, you know, past 24 hours, that is that can potentially be a killer in combat or even in just uh, uh, trauma patients not in combat, you know, maybe a truck rollover or ATV or something like that. I've heard you talk about the single unique instance uh, of the dreaded middle dose when that could be a positive thing. Can you quickly describe the circumstance? And I think that was with sepsis. And then we can direct our listeners to the episode. And I, I don't know the episode right off the top of my head. I just thought of this. So I'll look into it. Okay. So that we have to be, uh, we have to really separate out what, what I was talking about. about yeah. So the partially dissociated dose uh, is going to leave a patient kind of in a bad acid trip. That's how I continuously describe it because they're going to be seeing the world through. Uh, do you remember that uh, one of the new Batman movies where the scarecrow was a character and you just looked at that mask and it was just whatever was the scariest thing in your world was what oh, you yeah. saw? Yeah. yeah, so that's that's a partially dissociated dose of ketamine. So these patients basically are having a freaky, freaky trip, and they are not happy. And as a result, they will get massive catechol surge. Now we kind of, you know, took advantage of that for patients who are in hemorrhagic shock who were intubating. Um, because we'd sedate them the second the tube went in and we're not doing something so evil as, you know, trying to kill them or anything. And so we would take advantage of that if they, if they, we wouldn't try to put them there, but if they wound up there, we wouldn't feel too bad about it because they got a very nice hemodynamic response, but we were paralyzing those patients. So we were doing it for RSI. So a uh, partial dose 
range of ketamine plus rocuronium or succocholine will leave you with a you know totally amiable patient because they're paralyzed. But if you're going to be using it as solo agent, I would stay away from that partial dissociation dose if you could do anything to avoid it. Try to stay either recreational or fully dissociated. Got it. Okay. That clears that up for us. So that was my last question. Is there anything else you think I should have asked for a long-term procedural sedation um, from the perspective of a medic carrying uh, a patient, you know, over a long, prolonged evac over a span of a couple of days, perhaps? Yeah. You know, you could get away with ketamine alone, but at some point you might want to try. And if you're going to try this, I would have more ketamine drawn up in case it doesn't work out the way you want. I think it's worthwhile once you've stabilized the patient sufficiently, you feel good about their hemodynamics and they're in a good place where if they make some noise, it's not going to um, cause big problems for you folks. Uh, letting the patient emerge and seeing how they would do with just either analgesic dose of the ketamine or uh, going to something like morphine at this point where it's much more uh, a better potential drug because they've been stabilized and seeing because many patients with just good analgesia alone are perfectly happy to tolerate an endotracheal tube and in fact prefer it than to be putting be putting down be put down continuously into a dissociated state or a deeply sedated state so i i think that would be worthwhile if you feel the moment is right to see if you get to the patient to a pure analgesic situation. All right. Thank you so much, Scott, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with me uh, on behalf of the working group. We really do say thank you. And so we'll be collecting our listeners' comments and questions in the feedback box and uh, through various media. We don't have a Reddit page yet, as you do. So right now we're still working off of Facebook till we get the, uh, the Reddit up and running. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, we hope to talk with you again on the 23rd of May for Flipped Classroom, the uh, live portion. I can't wait. And uh, Paul, if it's okay with you folks, if people have questions that day that aren't ketamine but are pertinent to them, I am happy to answer them. So um, any questions that you guys feel I could answer, I, I'd be more than honored to help on that. Yeah, that'd be great. We have, you know, end title questions, airway questions. So uh, we'll have to keep it to the schedule, but I really do appreciate that. Thanks so much. And then let me take an opportunity to just thank all of you for what you do. I mean, it's if if we pretend that our job's hard in the emergency department, what you folks are doing is is really miraculous. So thank you for your service. Oh, thanks so much, Scott. We appreciate the support.